welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Welcome to Your Family Dog. I'm Tina Spring, and I'm joined with Julie Fudge-Smith, and today we're going to talk about blending families, integrating dogs, pets with that, and it can be complicated. It can Um, be very complicated. Yeah, I mean, honestly, as a dog trainer, sometimes those are some of the hardest calls, right? The the hardest yeah. cases to work on. There's a lot of moving pieces, and it can go really sideways. So I think probably you and I would agree on some of the basics, that, that great relationships take time and effort. There takes some time to get to know one another and and to assess like is how we've always done things with dog x is that still going to work the same way when our family has different people and maybe a different location and maybe other pets and other routines um so i think the more i think a lot of times i get calls from people who kind of knew it wasn't going to go very well but they just wanted to stick their heads in the sand and then big surprise. It's not going very well. Right. Um, and what I would say is like, don't wait. How are we, if we were to do this, what would that look like? And what would we need to navigate? Right. One of the things that, that I also think if you're going to blend families, it seems to me that, that you don't just sort of meet somebody and go, Oh, hi, I really like you. Let's just move our families in together and see if the kids get along, right? You, you spend, oh, I think you, you spend, just don't live in a college town. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you do things like you have your kids meet his kids and you have, you know, you, you spend time getting to know one another, see if it's going to work. You can do something similar with the dogs as well. That perhaps one of the things to do is I found to be somewhat successful is to have the dogs meet in a more neutral territory. So we're not, one dog's not meeting on the other dog's turf, um, but they're meeting and going for a walk together. So it's not uh, a com- complete and utter shock when you move in. I think it's important to sort of think about how can we make this as stress-free as possible for everyone involved, people and dogs. Um, however, just because you, your dogs have met on neutral territory does not necessarily mean that they're going to do well when they actually move in together. But it certainly is a place to start. You're not looking like you agree with me. Oh, I, I disagree. I just think it starts with assessing where your dogs are. Like, I don't even start with let's put them together. Like, that's, I, I, maybe because I do so much aggression work and fear work, um, I I don't start with any introduction where the dogs actually touch each other. Like I don't like they don't even they're not even close to physical contact. Um, I actually start with assessment tools and going, well, how does your dog feel about other dogs and what experience has he or she had and how have those things gone in the past? Um, I think a lot of times I see this with rescue all the time. They're like, sure, bring your dog. We'll introduce them. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, that's insane. That's insane. Right. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to introduce my kids that way either. Like, no, it, I like things a lot slower. Okay. Maybe just cause yeah. I've been in practice a really long time and I see it go badly. So uh, I would, I generally start with like, let's have a heart to heart talking about each of your dog's strengths and needs. Let's talk about not just how the dogs are going to fit together with one another, but what are, what is our parenting style with our kids? How are our kids with the dogs? Have my dogs been, does, does my dog have the same rules as your dog? Like, I think it's, I think that there's so much pre stuff that kind of sort of needs to happen that if you don't do it, your dog may be leash reactive. Then introducing on leashes on a walk is a terrible idea. Is that true? Like that's so. I I think if someone's going to integrate families together, they need to hire a trainer who can who's not just like we could teach sitting down. Someone who understands behavior and stress and anxiety and can help them come up with a plan 
even before the dogs have ever set eyes on one another. Um, right. And I think a lot of that includes is, is a clear understanding of dog body language. So yes. that um, one of the first things that I would start with is really getting them to watch their own individual dogs and start saying, okay, I noticed that when like the neighbor dog starts barking, my dog's ears get flattened to her head. She tends to turn her head away. She shrinks down a little bit. Her eyes get real wide. Okay, so a loud dog is disturbing to your dog. These are all good things to know. So that you really need to understand what your dog's stresses are, what her stress signals are to these stresses, and um, how quickly do they accumulate. I mean, maybe your dog's ears get pressed to the back of their head when somebody starts barking, but that's all that happens. That's, you know, that's more of, okay, it's maybe a little bit loud, but if we're not showing any other stress signals, then, you know, that's not that big a deal. And they soon relax and everything's fine. But if your dog is beginning to show an accumulation of stress signals and not easily letting go of them, even, say, when the barking stops, that's something to really take note of, that your dog has a hard time managing stress and a hard time letting go of stresses. Then you need to understand that so that when you are, you know, in the process of trying to even introduce a dog, you know when to back off before this dog gets the... And what happens when you get an accumulation of stress signals? Does the dog shut down? Does the dog... Some dogs, there's different reactions to stress. Some dogs may shut down in the presence. Other dogs may decide to fly. You know, I just get me out of here. And other dogs may become aggressive. You know, it's fight, flight, or freeze. And it's really and pull around in the yes. case of doodles. Yes, oh, right? doodle. all that all the goofy silliness that you're like, oh, okay, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, um, we had a golden think... that used to do that. He would just get like, okay, hi, I'm just like, oh, 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 so oh, oh. and I'm just okay, hi. Right. Yeah, like, you think you can hear clown music? Yes, <laughs> right. Well, I tell people that there are generally right. five reactions to stress: flight, f- flight, freeze fooling around and fainting, but dogs don't generally faint. That's what, you know, they're fainting goats and there's fainting people. But, and if your dog faints, it's a blood pressure issue. So see your vet, but people or they faint. can't breathe. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it's really important to understand not only your dog's specific stress signals, but what kind of a stress reactor is he or she does, is he a freezer? Is he a flighter? Is he a, you know, fooling around? Um, because that may make a difference in how the other dog perceives him, you know? Well, and honestly, sometimes you just can't integrate the animals, right? Like you just can't, it's not safe. It's not prudent. It's not appropriate. And yet I see people try to do it all the time. Right. And, and let me tell you, you want a deal breaker on a relationship, you know, have one person's dog kill the other person's cat. I mean, sometimes and those, nobody likes to think about that. Like, I totally understand that the heart wants what the heart wants. Like nobody wants to have to give anything up. Nobody wants to have to make adjustments. But honestly, sometimes I see things that I'm like, OK, I don't actually see a way that you can safely make this work. Um, And rehoming, honestly, is not the worst thing that can happen. It just isn't. Right. Um, right. I I think, honestly, the worst thing that can happen is when we force something that ought not be forced, right? Like, I see that end really catastrophically badly. So um, uh, I have totally said to people, like, I don't, I don't think these two dogs, I don't even think you should attempt it. It's not safe. Or your dog has killed eight cats in the past and your new paramour has cats. Like, I don't, like, you're going to have a referee's whistle. And management will always fail. And I think that's the piece that gets lost. People go, well, we'll just, we'll keep the cats on the second floor and the dog on the first floor. And, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Somebody's going to leave a gate open the cat's going to be sneaky, right? Like nothing makes a cat want to go through a door by telling them other than telling them not to go through the door. So, and the same with a dog, 
right? Like yeah. you tell a dog, no, you will not go upstairs. They're like, what's upstairs? All of the things. So I, I think, um, I think this integration thing is really hard and then everybody has their own way of doing it. So just like all the complications of integrating children into blended families, um, all those complications happen with the dog too. So my dog is awesome. Your dog is bad. Right. Um, <laughs> right. My, so- my dog, my dog should be allowed to be on the furniture, but your dog can't. Um, Things that people have been totally gotten away with having an only dog that they're not really, we would not advise with a multiple dog household, like free feeding, right? right? Or, 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 you know, having squabbles over stuffed Kongs or Chewies or whatever that the dogs have always, oh, well, my dog always gets this or never has to use a crate or, wow, there's a lot. There's yeah, a lot. There, there is manage. a lot. And, and, the, and the fact is, is you don't know how your dog is necessarily going to respond with a, with a bully stick or a, a stuffed Kong if he's never had to have it around another dog. That might be a real eye opener to begin with um, because you don't know your dog may well be, may not resource guard from people, but could very well resource guard from other dogs. And, um, and it may be enough of a little err. Uh, you know, and that the dog was like, okay, fine, I'll leave you alone. But it could be that your dog is very intense in its resource guarding over it. Depending on it, it could depend on the item. I, I, you know, I had one dog, didn't resource guard a thing, except these special cookies that we got for the horses. And my daughter left some in her tack box, which was sitting in the yard. And, and Rebel was sniffing around in the tack box. And I'm like, Rebel, get out of there. Come on. And went over and he growled for the first time ever at me. And because there was a Winnie in there and he loved these things, I had no idea. No, And that's the only thing he ever growled over was a Winnie. So, I mean, we just were real careful with the tack boxes and the, and the horse treats. But I didn't know that. I never expected that from Rebel until he had the opportunity to find something that he really, really enjoyed. The... um. The other thing is, is, is we're, we're not just talking about, you know, couples who, um, you know, are, are they're, it's their second marriage and they're blending, you know, kids and families. This can also be an issue. We talked a little bit about this before the show with going off to college and you taking your dog with you. And, oh, and for, yeah. And for goodness sakes, like, so we have neophyte dog owners where mom and dad have always trained all the, the dogs, um, so I, I live in a universe, a big university town. Um, school literally started today when we're recording, um, and the calls have already started. Right, my roommate's dog is a maniac, and he's humping people, and he beats up my dog, and he isn't house trained. And I can I can try to help, but I, I have totally said people don't renew their lease. Like, just send your dog home to mom and dad. I will talk to mom and dad. Like, hopefully they're willing to do that, but you're not going to change what your roommate's doing. Like That's they, right. Oh, it's, it's a big one. It's a really big one. And, or people like, I mean, I had someone who called me, I don't know, a month ago. She has two big dogs. Um, both of them newly out of rescue. Both of them landed in rescue for cat killing. That is what got them put into rescue. She said, great. I'm not really a cat fan. It'll be awesome. She brings one dog home. A month later, she brings the second dog home. She's already having troubles integrating the two dogs. And her roommate goes and gets three kittens. That's just a recipe for a complete and utter disaster. Right. I mean, it's like how to make a dog trainer curl up in, in the fetal position and weep. Like, right. I, I'm not a magician. Right? Like, and and... You know, she she wants me to guarantee that the dogs won't be predatory. I said, I no one can actually do that. Of course, they're going to be predatory. That's right. Well, the the other thing is is kind of like you don't understand the level of management. If you are insisting on making this work, right? Training takes time and practice. And so, while we are trying to train the dog to go against its very nature, which good luck with that one. Um, right. You have to manage excruciatingly carefully. 
you have got to manage every every doorway, every person that comes in, any time that there's, you know, and, and management is not 100%, and it just simply cannot work, and you are bound to put yourself and your dogs and the cats in, a, in a, an extraordinarily dangerous situation. And some things are just kind of not meant to be, and wow. it's really it's really very difficult to talk to people and say, look, I'm really sorry, but I don't see a way out of this, at least in so, any way, shape, or form that's, that is going to be, you know, done in, without a great deal of, of and, and are you going to be there to supervise? Is somebody always going to be there to supervise? Is everybody always going to follow all the rules about every door and every gate? And, you know, we're going to need to be talking about multiple layers of gates and... Right. And when we're talking about you add the complication of kids, and I love kids, I think, like, the great love affair between an, our animals and our kids is just lovely and wonderful and it's great, but it's complicated. It is complicated. And, and I'm sorry. Like I, I, again, I've been in practice long enough to have the child open the, be mistaken and open the wrong door and have the dog kill the cat in front of them. Right. So sometimes it, the, I, th- I think I am more guarded about, well, I'm definitely more, I think when it's two adults in a household, I'm like, okay, well, you can be kind of foolish and that's your choice. Like the consequences land where they're going to land. But I pretty regularly see people trying to blend animals, whether it's cats, dogs, whatever, that the dog fight is happening and the kids are in the middle of it. Right. Um, And I just... I just, my advocacy kind of kicks in in a really different way. And I just say, like, this isn't okay. Right. Um, well, one of lots those... of people have single dogs because their dogs are dog reactive. Blending two dog reactive dogs together with little kids is a disaster. It's bad for dogs. It's bad for kids. And it's bad for this individual family. I, I um, couldn't agree with you more. And, and one of the things that, that I always try to remember is, it's sort of I have this hierarchy of being and people always come before dogs and kids. I, when I'm taking care of a family, if I'm taking care of what's right for the family, then I'm generally taking care of what's right for the dog. And, um, I've got to put kids in, above dogs because if I don't, then I usually get myself into trouble and I start making mistakes about how to manage something because we're trying so hard to make it work with the dogs. And, you know, kids are kids and kids, they are, they, you know, they, and, and no child should be traumatized by watching his beloved cat be mauled by a dog or watch their two dogs get into a fight and draw blood. And this is just, this is horrific for kids and something that if, if it's not going to work, then you need to be realistic about the, the situation, especially if you have dogs who have a propensity for you know, doing things like, like Zuzu, she kills chickens. She just does. And so that's why like the breeder didn't get chickens when she had Zuzu and uh, failed to tell me that because she knows I don't have chickens. But when I went up to visit my daughter and my son-in-law told me he put the chickens up, but then he forgot. So I let Zuzu out in the yard. We had a dead chicken. Well, thank goodness the kids were always sleeping in bed and I cleaned up the dead chicken and, um, you know, it was, um, thank goodness that the little Grace, my two-year-old uh, granddaughter, was not watching out the window as Zuzu killed one of her chickens. So, you know, if, if you have a dog that has a propensity well, in that and, direction, to try and put right. it in a situation where it's not going to exercise that propensity, even though it's there, that's, that's just insane. It's kind of like, I don't know, putting Klondike bars in front of me, right? I'm <laughs> uh, Donuts. Right. Donuts for the dog trainer named Tina. Yes. Well, uh, so I'll even take it a layer deeper. I have a, I have a client, ra- I have clients right now who are lovely, lovely, absolutely adore them. Absolutely adore their dog. They're getting ready to welcome a baby home probably in the next uh, two weeks. And so as we're doing preparing the dog for life with baby and we've got some work to do there, um, they brought up that one of the mom, one of the grandmas, um, is 
quite literally terrified of everything that we would consider a companion animal. Um, and, and it's not cultural. It is actually, she panics, like she is terrified. Mm -hmm. And so they were talking about that when they go to visit her, they take their dog. And I was like, okay, I actually don't think that's okay. Like it has nothing to do, like that's her home. She, she, in my opinion, right. She ought not be subjected to that in her subjected own home. to that. Like that's not appropriate. And I, you I understand like your dog's lovely and she is, she's a lovely dog and they're a lovely couple and they're, they do everything with their dog. So from their perspective, it's like, well, why should we have to board our dog? Um, and so, yeah, like there's, there is, I, I don't know. I get myself probably into a significant amount of mischief <laughs> in that I go, yeah, that's actually not okay. It's that's right. not okay with me. So the same thing, like I had a, a couple who was getting married that one of the children young had had a really nasty bite from a grandparent's dog. Pretty typical story. Um, and the, the child was like eight or nine and terrified of dogs. And one of the, this new blended family had a dog who was lovely. It, it's not about the dog. It's about, we don't, we don't, that's flooding. <laughs> like, it's just going to go. Right. And, and, and like, you, we just and you don't, don't do it. Right. You don't put somebody into a situation where they will be, where, where every single ounce of their resources has to go to, making sure that I don't completely lose it to put somebody in a, in, in, in that level of fear or that level of panic or that level of discomfort is just simply wrong. I wouldn't do right. it to a dog. I am certainly right. not going to do it to a person, especially in that right. person's home. And so, so if it's, if it's okay, we're just, we're going to board the dog when we go to grandma's house. Like, okay, that's fine. That's, I mean, it's an added expense, but you know, heck, you can send your dog to your friendly neighborhood positive reinforcement dog trainer and let them go to camp while you're on vacation, right? right? They'll get spoiled rotten and we'll teach them fun things. Um, tune up some skills. Awesome. Like, you can do that. But when we're talking about, like, I love you, you love me, I love my 10-year-old black lab who's perfect, and your 8-year-old child is terrified of dogs, we start having some really difficult conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you do. because I'm not going to blame that kid for being afraid either. No. And we're going to try to make it work. But in the end, like, I guess that's what I see over and over is that this integrating, whether it's a new dog, whether it's a foster pet, um, whether it's integrating a blended family I don't know. It's like people just assume like, oh, that's a dog and that's a dog and we'll put them together and they love my, I love my kids. So my dog and I love my dog. So my dog will love my kids and they'll love his kids too. And I'm like, oh, okay, like this is, wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And, and it reminds me a little bit of the, um, somebody who adopts a dog with numerous difficult problems and figures. If I just love the dog enough, that will be, that'll take care of the problems. And right. um, it doesn't. And it's not going to work when you're trying to blend families as well, especially if you have either a dog or one of the people in the family who has some real issues with, with, with either fear or discomfort or, you know, right. what, whatever it is. That makes it really tough, and um, or like a child with a significant behavior issue, right? That right. that they that they have serious medical or or even mental health issues. That it is now like I'm not going to subject a dog to that. I'm right. just not, and I'm not, and I'm not going to put the child in the position to be sicker. Right. Um, right. Well, and, and then people really struggle. Oh my goodness. This is, this is like the hardest one is when they have two dogs and the two dogs are fighting and I'm like, okay, you place the healthy one. And they're like, what? No, that's the good one. I'm like, I'm aware that one's easy to get adopted. The one that's hard to love. Yeah. That's the one you hold on to because that one, there aren't a lot of resources right. for. I mean, you want to, uh, yeah, it's like I have eight heads, not just two. So, 
what it really boils down to is taking a realistic sit- look at the dogs, at the living situation, at the the family members who are going to be participating in in this new family, and and identifying both strengths and weaknesses. I mean, it could also be too that you have a dog who's used to living on a farm and having you know, two or three acres to call its own, and you're now moving to a condo, that could be some real issues. So I think you need to take a, to try and take as best as possible to step back and take a look at the environment, the animals involved, and the people involved, and start weighing out strengths and weaknesses, and try to be as honest as you can, not just about your partner's dog or cat, but about your own dog and what your own dog's issues are. And then work with a trainer who can help you figure out whether or not this integration is going to be successful. And and understand that um, it's going to take a lot of time and patience and a sense of humor about all of this yeah, because yeah. it's not going to necessarily be easy. It, it can work out. I just remember when my daughter brought home uh, her flat-coated retriever tax. I've talked about this on, on other episodes, so I, I'll make this quick. Um, And we did a whole bunch of walking, parallel walking and three second greeting and, and then let them off lead in the backyard. And, and the integration of Tex with Bingley and Buckley went quite well, except for one thing. And that was for whatever reason, Tex decided that he had to lick Bingley's ears. Lick and lick and lick and lick. And Bing was like, you know, this is okay for a while, but, you know, I kind of need a break here. But we all wanted to watch a movie. So we had this wild setup of gates and furniture in our den so that Bing and I were on one side and Tex was on the other. (laughs) And so they could lay next to one another with a gate between them. and With plexiglass to stop licking. Yeah, but he couldn't lick Bingley's ears through the gate. And so after spending like the evening together having access but not access, things seemed to settle down. I think that was just Tex's sort of nervous tick in this whole thing. And they ended up being best friends. But, I mean, we had no idea that this was going to be an issue, that we were going to have this licking fetish. So we had to be really creative about... Uh, but he, you know, but he didn't bother Buckley's ears. So who, who knows why? So you know, try. We had to have a sort of sense of humor and be creative. We wanted to be together. Obviously, the dogs were getting along, but Bing needed obviously a break. Who wants to have your ear licked and licked and licked and licked? So you know, stuff may. Happen. I don't like having my ears licked at all. Yeah, I, I don't either. So not a favorite. <laughs> so it's one of those things where you also have to be aware of the fact that you can prepare as much as possible, but odd little things may happen. And you- I mean, we just adopted a pug last fall um, from rescue, right? I wanted a pug partially because our other dogs are all very special needs and I wanted social, right? I wanted the dog who like just was kind of bomb proof from a social standpoint. I didn't care if he was well-trained. That doesn't bother me. Well, God has a sense of humor so we have instead added to the Island of Misfit Toys um, the pug's death, which is like the hardest thing for one of my sensitive dogs. Like his go-to distance increasing signal is a grumble. And that stupid pug doesn't listen to him. He's rude. <laughs> so right now, like right now, I'm sitting here helping you know, we're recording the podcast. The pug is on a leash tied to a chair in the other room so that he can't close the distance on the sensitive dog. Pug is happy as a lark. He's probably either asleep on the chair or chewing on a bony. He's wonderfully, you know, he's a five-year-old dog. He's polite. He's kind. He's a really great dog. But Marco's sensitive, and the pug really wants to be his best friend. (laughs) So he follows him around, right? <laughs> so well, I'll end up having a dog fight while I'm recording a podcast because the pug doesn't hear Marco. And Marco, for whatever reason, like, he doesn't snarl. He goes from grumbling under his breath to bite. Ah. So the dog's like, you're 
jerk. Like, you attacked me out of nowhere. There was no warning. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. So that, that's the situation. That, that, and that, I can't explain to you that he can't hear you. Right. And so that's a situation that requires a great deal of, of management and creativity, which is not something that you necessarily are going to come up with before the integration, which is why it's important to work what? with a trainer. So anyway, so. Well, uh, and then I think, it, imagine if we were adding like kids. Like, oh, for goodness sakes. Like, <laughs> I just, maybe that's why kids happen for the young. Yes. Then they have the energy. <laughs> like, I'm just like, okay, I kind of just want my coffee. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> can we just move through the day with, like, less drama? So, so yes. So, even, even when you're careful about choosing and going, okay, I want a, a really social dog and, you know, no dog directed aggression. And you check all the boxes and you go, okay, this is the dog we're going to bring home. It's awesome. The rescue was completely unaware that this dog has major hearing loss. They just were unaware. And I was just like, okay, well, it's a pug. They don't answer to their names. Like, they don't listen to you anyway. So, little, you know, then we find out, like, oh, yeah, no, he's significantly hearing impaired. Um, So, there's just... There there, there, there's, there's all, yeah, there are complications, and there's always going to be complications, which is why you don't want to rush it, which is why you want to yeah. be as prepared as possible. And three, you want to have some alternative plans. So if, so you don't just go in with plan A. So if plan A, you start to, you worked with a trainer, you come up with plan A, and it's not going well, what's plan B? You need to have yes. more than one way to look at something. So anyway, yeah. um. I think that uh, the, the it, it's sort of the, the, the same it's the answer we have in, in most of these podcasts, which is know your dog's body language, work yes. with a positive reinforcement trainer, have a sense of humor, and don't expect miracles overnight. And, and then, here's the thing. If you plan for the worst and the two dogs meet and they are star-crossed lovers and they are best friends and never look at each other sideways ever – Hurrah! Like I am gonna majorly celebrate that. Right. Um, I I I actually am really enjoying that that your podcast is willing to tackle um, some stuff, some like real complicated stuff, and to say to families like, okay, sometimes it's not gonna work, right? I think I see trainers pretty consistently judging families. And mm-hmm. expecting them to live under circumstances that we really would not want to live under, mm-hmm. right? Whether we were the dog or the people. Um, so I love that um, that you and I are at least in this like-minded. Yes. That we're like, okay, there are times that it's just not appropriate. And that might make somebody really mad at me to say that. I am. I endeavor to come from a place of love and respect. It's not judgment. It's there is. So a pastor once said there is suffering that you can avoid and there is suffering that cannot be avoided. And his view has always been avoid the suffering you can avoid. And to a certain extent, that's the lens I use with my the families I that choose to work with me. Right. Is like I don't I I have uh, in 27 years of practice. I have seen, heard, and seen enough horror stories. I, I don't want another sad story. Um, and so sometimes I perhaps be overly cautious because a family is precious to me. Right. To right. just say, like, we got to go slow, guys. Like, think in terms of introducing dogs over the course of 18 months, not 18 minutes. Right. And, and that's a long time. But I think yeah. that when you... When you talk to people about it, it brings home the whole thing about, you know, you probably didn't just meet this guy either and 18 days later decide to move in with one another. Because if you did, we need to talk about that. Um, but <laughs> um, actually, no, we don't because I'm not a marriage counselor. Um, but I'll help you find somebody who will talk to you about that because that's <laughs> kind of odd, too, that, that this takes time. So, um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I feel like um, I've had my own personal tragedies with dogs and my own feeling is, is that, um, I try to come at it 
not with judgment, but with compassion, but with a certain sense of realism. One of the things I do say to people, I say, you know, when we're looking, I, I've got a couple of clients in very difficult situations right now, and I'm saying to them, there's no judgment here from me, but one of the things I really want you to think about is how much time, how much money, how much energy, how much patience do you have to devote to this? And, you know, I don't, and don't worry about whether, you know, don't feel bad if you include money. Money needs to be part of that conversation. I can't tell you what weight to give it in the conversation, but it's okay to consider that as part of the conversation. And it's also okay to consider whether or not you actually have, you need to be honest with yourself. Do I have the time and the inclination and the patience to try and make, to work on this with an uncertain outcome. Yes. I mean, I had one of, so I, I do family pause. I'm a dogs and storks um, presenter. I had a family many years ago that had a dog who, like from the get-go, they were completely clear this dog is dangerous. It's dangerous to the dog is dangerous to us. The dog is dangerous to you. The dog is, you know, like this, our world is very small because this dog through meds, through behavior mods, saw a veterinary behaviorist, like did all of the things. This dog sadly was just ill-equipped for this world. Um, and they were pregnant and they contacted me when they were like five months pregnant. And fortunately, this dog was old. He was probably either 12 or 13, I think, at the time. Um, and and they said, like, we, we want to tell you what our plan is, which is to love him as much as we can. And about a month before our due date, we'll euthanize. It required, and what they wanted me for was to have the conversation with the extended family. Mm. Because... This dog was, like many really, really dangerous dogs, lovely 95% of, of the time. time. He said like five 95% of the time, he was charming and Got kind it. and amazing. And 5% of the time, he was terrifying and dangerous and was going to kill somebody. Yeah. No, and I, I, I they understand. were like our families. Like, they've done such a good job at management that their family, of like, they avoided triggers they were able to do all of those things up until then so that their family, while they may have heard stories about him. Had never actually encountered that. Right. No, but all, but they were crystal clear that, that bringing an infant into their home, all of that was going to catastrophically change and they weren't going to be able to protect the baby, the dog or themselves. Right. Um, and, and I can remember at first I was like, okay, wow, that's a lot, right? Like maybe even being taken aback a bit at first, right? Like I'm in the job of fixing. <laughs> so I'm like, no, no, no. We like my gut goes, oh, no, no, we want to, I want to fix this. And, and just as we talked about it, I was like, okay, I absolutely agree with their decision and how brave and how kind of them to go, this is not going to be fair to anybody. Yeah. Um, I much honestly, and, and it sucks. I don't recommend euthanasia very often. Thank goodness. Um, but I much prefer that to somebody calling me after a completely unstable dog has done catastrophic damage to their child. Oh, I, I agree. I, I agree. And I, and, and, right, so. and, and I think any reasonable person and certainly most veterinarians I know would, um, absolutely and pediatricians. Agree. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, so well, yeah, this stuff, I mean, sometimes there, there is just sad stuff with there is. this. And, and, and it's also often awesome. Right. So <laughs> and I have to and, remember that too, that there's a lot of awesome. Right. People always ask me, Oh, what a happy profession. You must be just, I'm like, yeah, <sighs> there is, but you also don't understand there's a dark side. And, and be, because you know what? The human condition is such that we have both angels and devils in our nature and that we, there is sometimes when suffering happens and there's not much you can do. And there's not a family, there's not a person that doesn't 
have to suffer at some point. So what can we, how can we, I I too am Catholic. So part of it for me is always that if the suffering has to happen, what can I bring out of the suffering that is good? Um, what, where can I go from there? So I also think it's really hard for dog trainers to be brave and sometimes say to a family, no, like, no, I can't really help. And, and honestly, even if I think I could, I ought not. The risk is too big. Yeah, and that's no. really hard. That's very hard. So. Oh, yeah, because it's like how to harpoon your reputation, right? It, um, yeah. We are in a world right now where people don't like hearing no, <laughs> yeah. right? And so it, I, I think on the rare occasion that I am saying that to a family, that we're having a difficult conversation, um. They know that I'm coming from a, a place of love and admiration, and and I'm going to tell them like if you want to go get a second opinion, I absolutely understand, um, and and that I clearly understand the consequences of what I'm telling them, whether I'm saying let's keep going or whether I'm saying no, this is enough. Yeah, and what I usually tell people is I say when we get to that point, I'm saying okay, this is how I see it. These are the options that I see that you have, and I usually am able to list three, four options of what we can do with this situation. And I always tell them, I am not going to tell you which option to choose. What I will tell you is whatever option you choose, I'll support you. Right. Unless, of so course, I'm talking I mean, actually about those cases yeah. where I'm like, if your answer is to keep letting your dog off leash when your dog is dangerous to man and beast, I actually will not support that. Right, right. To, yeah, right, because I, I cause sadly, like there are, I do ever, thank goodness, very rarely run up against somebody who goes, well, I just don't want it to be this way. Okay, well, good luck with that. Like, yeah, no, yeah. I agree. And I, I do the same thing. But the idea being, I am not going to tell you exactly right. what you need to do. Um, right, like, within the be, realm of safety and being a good citizen of the right. universe. If, if you choose, like, okay, option number four is not really an option, and most of the time they recognize that, but you still have to sort of list it, right? This, as long as you choose, you know, options one through three, you'll get my help. You choose right. option number four, we need to talk some more kind of thing. But anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Tina. That was a great episode. I hope we um, haven't completely... You know, depressed people. <laughs> with the idea yeah, we might need to talk about some fun stuff sometime. <laughs> we will talk about fun stuff. Um, but I think um, blended families is an important one, and I think it's one that happens all the time and is not talked about all the time. I don't think people really talk about what it takes to blend a family of uh, people and animals, and that if you want it to be successful, there's some serious thought that needs to go into it. So, Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Tina, and we'll see you all next time on Your Family Dog. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.